I've briefly touched upon the shady tactics used by the governments to foment public support for war. One such program by the U.S. was put in place during the Cold War called Operation Gladio. The aim of which was to have paramilitary organizations stay behind in the Eastern Bloc to continue the destabilization of regional powers. And although the program was finally acknowledged in 2006 and is said to be long over, some allege that it never really ended. Instead, this clandestine operation simply morphed to fit the needs of the war on terror. Here to help me break down this very important and convoluted subject is James Corbett, independent journalist and host of The Corbett Report. Thanks for coming on, James. Thank you for having me, Abby. So what did Operation Gladio consist of and how far reaching was the program? Well, you were recently on the program talking about the top five conspiracies that turned out to be true, and I think Operation Gladio has to rank up there among them. Uh, Gladio is the code name for a clandestine operation that, as you indicate, was set up by NATO in conjunction with the CIA uh, in the wake of World War II as the Cold War started to develop. And the official cover of this uh, program was that it was designed as a stay-behind program to fund, train, equip, supply, and uh, otherwise facilitate uh, groups to be ready in the case of a Soviet invasion of Europe. And if that were to happen, basically these groups would be able to resist uh, the, the Soviet occupation forces while uh, NATO prepared some sort of military response. That was at least the official cover for, for what was happening. But ultimately what, what resulted from this was over the course of the, the five decades of the Cold War, uh, these, uh, these funds and, and uh, arms and equipment were going to uh, paramilitary groups and ultranationalist groups that were basically uh, against uh, hardline anti-communists. And this resulted in a number of different operations, events, and outrages that ultimately were blamed on communists as a way of trying to um, basically uh, cripple the, the, the political left in Europe during that period. And perhaps the best known of those outrages and atrocities was the 1980 Bologna bombing, which killed 85 people and wounded 200 uh, more. That was, again, directly linked to this Operation Gladio. Uh, it was eventually exposed in the 19, early 1990s in the the Italian parliament and uh, eventually that that resulted in an outcry that that was supposedly going to kick off a European parliamentary investigation that never actually occurred. But uh, we've been led to believe in a lot of the English language media and in the Western world that this was specifically focused on Europe and it specifically started and ended with the Cold War. But in fact, um, as more information continues to come out about it, we start to see that in fact the field of operations of Operation Gladio really is global and that it continues to this current day. Well, let's talk about that transition. I mean, very shocking. I, I didn't even really understand the extent of Operation Gladio until I was watching your series. I recommend everyone to check that out. Um, really thorough series, just basically outlining everything that this operation was. As you said, I mean, it's a decades-long operation that consisted of false flag terror attacks, death, um, the funding of ultra-nationalist groups to foment terrorism. Um, let's talk about the transition into Gladio B. You said that there's evidence showing that this is actually still happening today and it's actually morphed into something else. What is that and what evidence is there to back that up? Well, as, as you say, I, I had a video series that I conducted earlier this year with FBI whistleblower Sibel Edmonds. And as people may or may not know, she's uh, been referred to as the most gagged woman in the United States by the ACLU and other organizations uh, for having the state secrets privilege applied to her case to classify all sorts of information about what she was working on at her time in the FBI in the translation department at the Washington field office. And basically, um, the information that she had indicated uh, that there was uh, a change that occurred in this Operation Gladio uh, that occurred in the mid-1990s. And she was specifically focused on the Turkish uh, field of operations. And this is, this is again, documented and on the record, although little known and little talked about in the Western media. But uh, Turkey was, in fact, one of the first places where Operation Gladio eventuated and was, in fact, one of the central places as a geostrategic window, uh, the bridge, uh, so-called bridge between Europe and the Middle East, it's always had a geostrategic location and as such was one of the jewels in the crown of the Operation Gladio program. But in the mid-1990s, Operation Gladio started to shift from that funding of paramilitaries and ultranationalist groups um, in Turkey specifically towards the, uh, the uh, an operation more like what we saw in Afghanistan in the 1980s, where the U.S. specifically was funding and helping and training and arming the uh, Mujahideen in their fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Uh, 
And this was this became the model for what's uh, what's known as Gladio B. Uh, Gladio B is the term that uh, Sibel Edmonds indicates is the actual FBI file that they have on this uh, on the information on this in the FBI. But uh, there is a different name for the, whatever office in the Pentagon actually works with NATO on this operation. Um, that's still classified. We don't know that, but we do know that it's referred to as Gladio B by the FBI. And basically, this is the cooperation of NATO and U.S., uh, including high-ranking U.S. Uh, State Department officials and others, with uh, Islamic uh, terrorists, basically, um, in the perpetuation of a strategy of tension, which can be used as a type of weapon against, uh, specifically in Central Asia and the, the Balkans, and uh, sorry, the Central Asia and the Caucasus region, which is an exceptionally important part of the global uh, chessboard, as, as Big New Brzezinski talks about. And in fact, in his 1997 book, The Grand Chessboard, he identified Central Asia as the absolute key um, for anyone who wants to have world dominance in this day and age needs to control Central Asia. And that's where we find a lot of these operations now are being based, with uh, U.S. and NATO officials cooperating with Islamic terrorists in order to foment uh, a type of destabilization that is aimed ultimately against uh, rivals Russia and China. Right. Uh, very fascinating. I remember in the video series you're talking about right before 9-11, I think 1997 to 2001. I mean, we're talking about al-Zawari, alleged top al-Qaeda officials being flown out, fostered by NATO, um, propagated by NATO and also the CIA and, and covert forces in the area. You said that this is actually going on still to this day. Um, what are they doing? And, and explain really how this manifested into perpetuating what we're seeing play off across that region of the world right now. Well, you're, you're exactly right about that. And again, this comes directly from Sibel Edmonds, who was, uh, was working directly with the information from the FBI that, uh, that Ayman al-Zawahiri was meeting with top-level U.S. officials in Baku, Azerbaijan in 1997 to 2001 in that range. And uh, this is important because uh, for people who don't know, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri was, of course, Osama bin Laden's right-hand man and is now the, the nominal head of al-Qaeda itself. So the fact that he had such high-level contacts for so many years with, uh, uh, the, in the heart of the U.S. State Department and with high-ranking officials is an exceptionally big story obvious for obvious reasons and uh, and the fact that this is still ongoing i think is uh, is uh, certainly viewable in the context of what's happening in that central asia caucasus region with uh, with countries of of such importance uh, geostrategically like uh, azerbaijan and kyrgyzstan and tajikistan which are in that caspian sea basin and that corridor where a lot of the pipelines for those oil resources are being hardwired right now and i wanted and to jump course, in here really really areas, quickly james because we have about a minute left, but of course, Sabelle talks about drug running um, in this operation as well from the, the heroin from Afghanistan. But really quickly, I mean, why haven't more of these allegations been covered in even independent media, James? Unfortunately, there is the uh, total wall of silence on this, and part of the reason I think in the uh, in the independent media hasn't picked up on it is because there is so much uh, to talk about, and there are so many connections that a lot of people just simply haven't even heard about before. So it is an area of the globe that a lot of people aren't familiar with, and it takes a lot of uh, coaching to get people familiar with the, some of the players and names and dates. So uh, just uh, that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been featured in the independent media, and obviously the mainstream media, um, unfortunately, as we know, is controlled on these types of subjects and won't go near this type of uh, blockbuster information. Well, now that you've kind of outlined the preliminary uh, base of knowledge about it, we'll get you on again to break it more down. Thank you so much. James Corbett, Corbett Report. Everyone check out the series Operation Gladio. Thank you. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex?